Hey everyone, I'm Amanda Thomas, and I'd like to welcome you to A Scientist Walks Into a Bar. This podcast features recordings of talks given at Science on Tap, a series of science lectures held in Portland, Oregon, and Vancouver, Washington. This episode is the talk, Trechnology, the Real Life Science Behind Star Trek's Technologies, with Dr. Ethan Siegel. Ethan is an astrophysicist and an author, and he writes a blog on Forbes.com called Starts With a Bang, which is all about exploring the story of the universe. He also wrote a book called Trechnology, the science of Star Trek from tricorders to warp drive, which, as you might have guessed, provides a lot of the material he talks about during this episode. It's about things like photon torpedoes and tractor beams that were only fiction when they were featured on Star Trek, but some of them are getting a lot closer to reality or may already exist. He talks about the original series with Kirk and Spock, as well as The Next Generation, Deep Space Nine, Enterprise, and the rest of them. This recording took place at the Kiggins Theater in Vancouver, Washington, back when the book was released in late 2017. And even though that was a little while ago, this book is still super interesting and you should definitely check it out. I will include links to both his blog and his book in the episode description and on our website. Engage. So I wrote a book, Trechnology. The idea for this book happened last year when it was the 50th anniversary of the original Star Trek series. And, you know, when I was in high school, I read this book. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. It's called The Physics of Star Trek by Lawrence Krauss. And I was pretty excited about that because it talked about a handful of the technologies from Star Trek The Next Generation. And, you know, now I'm a physicist, and it's 20 plus years after that. And many of the technologies that were considered plausible um, are here. Like, some of them actually exist. Other technologies that were considered to be, uh, that'll probably never happen, uh, well, we've made some physics breakthroughs, and they appear to be well on their way. So I'm excited to sort of talk to you about the technologies in Star Trek, a little bit about what makes it Star Trek, and then to go through maybe some highlights of some of my favorite technologies that are featured in Star Trek and talk about where they are and how close we've come to making them a reality. So there are a few things. I, I always like to tell people what I'm going to talk about so you don't have to, like, guess. The first thing that I think is always important to talk about is the vision of Star Trek, right? Star Trek isn't just like this futuristic sci-fi series. There have been plenty of those, and there will continue to be plenty of those. But there are some things about Star Trek that made it unique and special that continue to the present day, and I'd like to remind everyone what those are. And then there's actual science behind the fiction. This is not just space fantasy, where you make up whatever rules you want. Star Trek particularly the original series and the next generation, in general, they tried very hard to stick to what could be physically possible to happen. And Q. <laughs> so then we come to the problems facing humanity, because that's, that's another big thing about Star Trek, is Star Trek is never just about like, oh, we're gonna have all these new technologies and things are gonna be great. Star Trek was also about Whatever we develop, whatever breakthroughs we have, these are going to be used for the good of all of humanity. They're going to be used to counter some of the problems we have that face our world, that plague our world, that have maybe faced humanity for thousands or hundreds of thousands of years. Um, so I, I'd like to put a little view towards that. Star Trek envisions solutions to these problems, and then we're gonna get into how science is working now to make some of these visions and some of these dreams actually come true. So when we talk about the vision of Star Trek, I like to think about three different things that, that all came together to make Star Trek this grand vision that it is. The first one is, this. Star Trek came of age in 1966 was when it first hit the airwaves. 1966 was also the year that the United States in earnest started to take the lead from the Soviet Union in the space race. 
right? The Soviet Union beat the United States in a lot of ways. The Soviet Union had the first thing in space with Sputnik. The Soviet Union had the first human in space with Yuri Gagarin. They had the first dog in space with Laika, who just had her 60th anniversary of her voyage, uh, I think earlier this week. Um, they had the first person to go orbit the Earth. They had the first uh, space communication between two different cosmonauts in space. They had the first woman in space who was also part of that first interspace communication, uh, Valentina Tereshkova, for those of you curious. Um, but starting in 1966, um, with the unmanned, uncrewed Apollo missions, the United States started to do something that the Soviet Union hadn't done. Uh, we started to send things up to the moon and orbit them and land on them. Um, and then we, uh, in 1968, I believe, was when we uh, finally had uh, Apollo 8 and humans sent to the moon to orbit it. And that was pretty fantastic. But 66, we knew that space was awesome. Uh, and this is actually a picture of the first American uh, spacewalk that was ever performed. That was by the uh, Gemini astronauts. Space is awesome and we know this, right? When we look out at the distant universe and we see a shot like this, this was something that we've done with the advent of the Hubble Space Telescope, where we just took our telescope, we pointed it at a blank patch of the sky, and this is a total of 23 days of exposure. We, we didn't take one image, we added a whole bunch up. But that's what you wound up with, and wow, this is what you see in the dark abyss of space, is just galaxies everywhere you look. Uh, some of them are pretty close, only a few hundred million light years away. Some of them are very far, like 30 billion light years away. Um, so space is awesome. It is grand. And also, there's so much to explore out there. We know of other stars with other planets around them, some of which may be potentially habitable, some of which may already have life on them, and some of which most of which are very different from the planets in our solar system. So there is a whole lot to be excited about. And that was one of the first things that Star Trek brought us was this vision of, wow, there are some amazing things out there and we are in our technological infancy taking our very first steps out into this final frontier. And we're only taking our first steps because space is hard. This is Earth, as taken from Saturn. It's a lot of effort to go even to another planet in our own solar system, much less to journey across the stars. It is a big, big, big effort just to overcome the bonds of Earth's gravity. And yet we can do it if we pool our resources, if we work together, if we collaborate, we can make this happen. We can make what was once thought to be impossible almost mundane, right? We can make this a common reality. And that's the vision of Star Trek, is despite our differences, if we can put that aside, we can make it. We can make it off of Earth. We can make it as far into the universe as our technology and our mind and our ambitious spirits can take us. So that's one. Star Trek, in addition to bringing us mostly naked aliens, also brought us a vision where the ethos of the series was to be good to each other, that you are going to encounter people, other races, beings from other planets, aliens, things that might not even be humanoid, things that you might not even recognize as alive, that are very, very different from you, and yet, if you treat them well, if you treat them with respect, if you treat them as equals, if you treat them the way you would like to be treated, good things can come of this. This is something that Star Trek wasn't afraid to bring to the world, and this was something that was relatively new, 
right? We know even here on earth, even here in the United States, most other civilizations are different from our own. We may look different, we may believe different things, we may approach problems differently, but in the end, we have to look out for each other. This universe is vast, and only through kindness do we stand a chance of navigating it. And that's the message, is despite our differences, despite the difficulties we have understanding each other, if we work together, we can achieve what seems to be impossible. And there was a third thing that Star Trek brought that I think is fascinating, more than the be good to each other message, more than the space is awesome message, and this is that we can build a good future for ourselves, that the future is not something to be afraid of, the future is not something that holds disaster for us, that the future is something that we should be optimistic about, right? When you look at the other contemporary science fiction things that were out there, you had Lost in Space, which was, which was this idea that we wouldn't be able to handle the dangers of our technology, that we, would, that we would just basically Gilligan's Island ourselves about it. And we didn't do that till the 90s with Voyager. <laughs> Sorry, I, some, a friend of mine called that Gilligan's starship one day, and I've never been able to get it out of my head. <laughs> you had things like the day the Earth stood still, or the Twilight Zone, or you know, other science fiction things where, where the future held these dangerous things and where it looked like humanity would destroy ourselves. But Star Trek gave us something different to aspire to. Star Trek brought us a vision of the future where humanity used our advances, used our technology, used our problem-solving skills to bring about a better future, not just for a few humans who were well off, but for everyone. It was something that personified the spirit of altruism. And through this vehicle, through this sort of new world that they built, they were able to explore issues, things like racism and sexism and equality and rights of other people, other beings, other aliens, that maybe we weren't ready to have a conversation about without that fictional lens on it. And Star Trek really helped make that possible. Through Star Trek, we got this idea that technology is the key to a better future. That if we pool our resources and work together and work to make the world better, the future really will be a place we'll all be proud to live. And the quality of life of all humankind will be better for it. Well, so I wrote this book about the science behind the fiction, and the book is called Treknology. Um, and think about what's possible if some of these technologies do become real. For one, man, who hasn't dreamed of like, not just like learning about the universe, but exploring it, but going out there and getting to see what it's like and landing on another planet and, and meeting another living species that doesn't exist anywhere on Earth and maybe even being able to communicate with them and exchange knowledge with them and, and learn from them. Like, that's, that's a dream that I think Star Trek reminds us, hey, like, don't lose sight of this. If we, if we work towards this, we might be able to make this happen. And these technologies that we use in our pursuit of knowledge, in our pursuit of exploration, they come in a lot of different varieties, right? We not only have like ship technology, but we have weapons technologies, communications technologies, um, computational technologies. Look at this circuitry on the next generation. That's great. That's the inside of a pad. We have uh, civilian technologies like replicators and of course medical technologies like Mr. Tricorder over here. The thing is, when we talk about the problems facing humanity, you wonder how many of these require us to move past a certain way of thinking, right? One of the things that Captain Picard said is the acquisition of wealth is no longer the driving force in our lives. We work to better ourselves and the rest of humanity, 
right? The, you might remember this from an episode where they sort of unfroze, cryogenically frozen people from the late 20th century. And uh, the guy was like, oh, how are all my stocks doing? And that's what Captain Picard said to him. A little bit of admonishment there from the future. Um, but that's a big difference, right? You think about why. Why do we acquire wealth? Why do we do this? It's because that's the means to a better life. Most of us don't see a better way to a better life than that. What Star Trek offers, though, is it offers a future where we've used technology to eliminate the need for this in everyone's lives, right? Here's, here's, here's our buddy Kirk Thatcher, right? If we take a look at the problems facing humanity, there, there are a whole lot of them, right? Poverty, needs or wants, war, hunger, resource scarcity, disease, energy needs, inequality, right? These are, these are real problems that, you know, even here in 2017, boy, sometimes it seems they're more front and center than ever. But it doesn't have to be. I know for most of us, we can look at some of these things and say, wow, just a few small changes, just a few small advances, and we can get rid of any one of these. Or maybe we could even get rid of all of these. And that's what Star Trek really dared to do, is it dared to say, what if, what if we go far enough into the future that we imagine that day is already here? What if we imagine that that we, we don't have this problem of poverty because, because money doesn't matter and everyone has food and shelter and all the necessities and people can pursue whatever it is they choose to, that they could create what they want, that they could be what they want, that they can, that they can literally pursue their own happiness and that doesn't mean trying to make money necessarily. What if we had freedoms from needs and wants where people weren't, you know, denied the basic necessities in life or the basic freedoms in life where everyone who was born just had that and didn't have to worry about that? What if there was no more war? What if, you know, I mean, boy, to even think about that, can you imagine just the United States, our military budget annually is $600 billion dollars? That's our one year's military budget. Can you imagine what we would accomplish, what we'd be able to accomplish as a society if we didn't have to budget $600 billion for that? If I take the entire budget of NASA and the entire budget of the National Science Foundation and I combine them, one year's worth of the military, if I put that money towards NASA and the National Science Foundation, we would have 25 times as much budget for science, for knowledge, for exploration than we have. For literally four years of the military's budget, we could fund a century of NASA and the National Science Foundation. So when we talk about getting rid of war, um, like just, if we just didn't do that anymore, like. <laughs> Like, I, I don't have an easy answer to get there. If I did, I would probably not be an author of a book. I'd probably be making it happen. Um, but if we could, you know, that's one of the things Star Trek dreamed about is what we could accomplish with that. No hunger? Well, who needs hunger when you have a food replicator? Right? That's, that's a nice thing. Resource scarcity? Well, who has resource scarcity when you have a replicator? Or... You know, anything like that. You know, these are, these are solvable problems, and technology is one way to get there. So when we look at the problems facing our dreams, right, sometimes it seems like the laws of nature itself are the only barrier left. If we can overcome our human barriers for it, then that's all that's left is, how can we work with the laws of nature to bring this vision to reality? And that's, and that's the tactic I took when I wrote this book, is I didn't want to necessarily look and say, well, you know, Star Trek says if you want the warp drive, you have to plug the dilithium crystals into the warp core and get your matter-antimatter annihilation going. And that's how... No, let's look at some real science and say, if we want this to happen, what does it take? 
right? Star Trek didn't get all the details exactly right. If they did, it wouldn't be a science fiction show. They would just be like, oh yeah, like we just figured it all out and we wrote a series about it and here you go. Like this is the key to the golden future, go open the door. I wish. So the Star Trek solution is through technology. This is how you do it. You make these technological advances, you make these scientific breakthroughs, that's how you arrive at a better future. But it's up to us. <laughs> it's up to us to make it so. So here is this big list of technologies that we've covered. In Starship technology, I thought of six that I thought were really important. Warp drive, tractor beams, transporters, impulse engines, transparent aluminum, and antimatter containment. For weapons and defense, I liked cloaking devices, deflector shields, phasers, and the infamous photon torpedo. For communications, there were just three. Subspace communications, communicators, and universal translators. For computing, we did isolinear chips, the holodeck and holograms, the ship's computer, pads, and androids. For civilian technology, replicators, synthahol. Boy, how many of you wish you had that tonight? I'd give it a shot. Automatic sliding doors and artificial gravity. And for medical and biological, it covered the emergency medical hologram, cybernetic implants, human life extension, con! Visors, hyposprays, and of course, tricorders. So let's start with a look at warp drive, right? It's arguable that warp drive is the ultimate Star Trek technology because without warp drive, there's no trekking across the stars, right? Otherwise, you've got this limitation, right? You've got the limitation of relativity. What relativity tells you this is Einstein's theory. It says, as you get closer to the speed of light, it takes more and more and more energy to get that extra little fraction closer to that ultimate speed. That you can never reach the speed of light, no matter how much energy you put in, as long as you're made of matter. So if you wanna go to a star that's 40 light years away, it's gonna cost you just so much energy to get up to speed and go faster and faster and faster. And then, when you're halfway there, you have gotta turn around and slow down and slow down and slow down so you can arrive and be like, okay, I'm here, I made it. And now everything is good, and I completed my mission, and I'm gonna go back home. And you go back home, and you speed up, and you turn around, and you slow down. And you come back home, and you're like, I completed my mission, and why is everybody dead? because it took you so long to get there. Even if for you, thanks to time dilation, you were able to make that journey fast. Maybe you made that whole journey in just one year. And then you made the return journey in just one year. But everyone back on Earth has aged 80 plus two years because that's how relativity works. You can accelerate but they still age. For you to go 40 light years, and if it takes you a year, they age 41 years. For you to come back 40 light years and it takes you a year, they age 41 years. That's not a good way to travel through space. You want people back home to still be alive. You want to say, how was the journey? Oh, it was awesome. You don't want to say, how was the journey? Well, tell my great grandkids. So Star Trek had this idea of warp drive. And the idea of warp drive is, rather than being limited by Einstein's special relativity, maybe we could do something to distort the fabric of space, that we could make this journey much more quickly than that. So this was one of the fun ones for me because back when the physics of Star Trek came out, this was just like a total fiction, and how do you do this? Well. It turned out that in uh, the mid-1990s, there was a physicist named Miguel Alcubierre, and he discovered a solution in Einstein's general theory of relativity that said, you know, um, you can do some funny things to space if you have the right configuration. And he figured out what the right configuration was. He said that if you build sort of a bubble 
around a starship or in space in general. You just assume you put your starship in there. Um, what you can do is in the direction that it's moving, you can compress the space in front of you. You can shorten the space in front of you so that instead of 40 light years to that nearest star that you want to visit, maybe it's only one light year now. How do you do that? You expand the space behind you. So what you can do is you can distort this bubble so that when you're moving in this direction, the space in front of you gets compressed, the space behind you gets expanded, and you're taking these big giant steps through this compressed space. So you're effectively cheating Einstein. You're effectively moving faster than the speed of light. Because as you go through that compressed space, more space in front of you compresses, and more space behind you expands. So you make this journey in a year, and you get there, and then you turn around, and now the space this way compresses, and the space behind you expands. And you go this way for a year, and you're back here in two years, and you've completed your mission, and everyone back home has only aged two years. And maybe that's if you go, you know, warp two. So maybe if you go warp eight, or warp nine, or warp 9.8, don't go warp 10, bad things happen. <laughs> but maybe if you go that fast, you can literally get wherever you want to go as fast as your ship will take you. Now, this takes a lot of energy to make happen, but this is physically possible. Warp drive is not necessarily this pipe dream. You just need something that we aren't sure we have in the universe, right? The thing you need to make it happen is you need some type of matter that has negative mass. What's kind of interesting about this is all the matter we've ever measured, what kind of mass does it have, has been normal matter. Stuff like me and you, right? We're made out of atoms, this boring old normal matter. Let me ask you, what happens if we make antimatter? If we took an atom of matter and we dropped it, we know it would fall at 9.8 meters per second squared here on Earth. What about if I took an atom of antimatter? we've never actually measured. If we took an anti-atom and we dropped it, we have not yet measured which direction it would fall. It's kind of remarkable, we've actually made neutral anti-atoms and we've confined them using electric and magnetic fields in a vacuum chamber where we've not only brought antiprotons and anti-electrons together to make anti-hydrogen atoms, we've held them stable for about 20 minutes. But unfortunately, uh, when you turn those electric and magnetic fields off, they always get attracted to the side of the chamber, and then they annihilate. Someday, though, there's an experiment at CERN called the Alpha Experiment, and they're actually working to try and make that exact measurement. They're trying to measure how does antimatter fall in a gravitational field. If it falls down, which, you know, look, everyone expects it's going to, then it's back to the drawing board for warp drive. But if it falls up, then this becomes an engineering problem rather than a science problem. And that's really interesting. Because um, then, you know, you've got your distorted space time and go in the direction it's compressed and there you go. Warp drive. I can't wait. <laughs> All right, what about tractor beams, right? This is something that, uh, it, I have to say, I think it's something that the Star Trek timeline, they must have gotten this wrong. And I say they must have gotten this wrong because there is no way that by the time the year 2151 comes along, we won't have tractor beams. There is such a remarkable way to make this happen, right? It, it almost seems like a crazy pipe dream, right? That what are you going to do? You're going to shoot out some, some light, and you're going to lock an object in place, and suddenly it won't be able to move, right? That, that sounds like fiction, and then you can slowly draw it in. Well, 
Here is the first working demonstration of an optical tractor beam. What you do is you have two lasers that emit light of various polarizations and pulses. So light, as you know, is a wave. It's an electromagnetic wave, which means it has electric fields in one direction and magnetic fields perpendicular to that direction, and it propagates in the forward direction. So if you have light here and light here, and you have a particle or a satellite or a macroscopic object or whatever you want, you can set up the electric and magnetic fields just like you would with standing waves. And for a standing wave, you know, if you take like a piece of string and you tie it to the wall and you start, you know, whoosh, wiggling it, you'll see, you'll see the pattern in the string. And then if you shine the strobe light on it, you can just see it looks like it's completely stationary. That's a standing wave. So you can do that with light. You can set up, oh, I have light of a specific frequency, and I have light of a specific frequency. It's electric and magnetic fields do something, and what you'll do if you configure it properly is you will have a fixed point a certain distance away that will be stable. If you move a little bit away from it, it'll pull you back to the center. If you move a little bit away from it the other way, it'll pull you back to the center. That's one of the things that a tractor beam does, is no matter how you try and move, it holds you in place. Then all you have to do is slightly change the direction that you're pointing these light beams. Just move it a little closer, and that'll move that fixed point a little closer, move that stable point closer. So if you start out over here, it'll pull you in. And you can change this slowly where someone can't get away, even if they thrust under their own power. And you can just bring them in. That's the very idea of a tractor beam. And it's only this decade that we've actually made this happen. What they did was, you know, it not only pulled particles against the direction that you shone light on them from, but it was able to control which direction they would be able to or wouldn't be able to move in this plane and also coming out of the, I can't really make it come out with a laser pointer. Um, but, but you can control which direction it moves as well as pinning it in place and then slowly dragging it towards you. That's, that's the literal definition of what a tractor beam is supposed to do. And here we have these working prototypes. What's remarkable about this, some technologies, you know, you need to put a little twist on them. You need to say, well, okay, so this will work, but it'll only work in air, or it'll only work if I'm surrounded by atoms. Because this one relies only on photons, and photons can travel through the vacuum of space just fine, you could do this in space. In fact, it, it's even easier in space because then you don't have all these pesky atoms in the way. So this is something where we've got the working prototype for a tractor beam here in our regular universe. So, you know, you might use your grapplers if you have to. <laughs> but I don't think we're going to have to for very long. I do think it's going to be a while before we get Star Trek The Next Generation level technologies that a tractor beam can move fragments of a star's core. <laughs> we'll, we'll see about that one. I'm, I'm not holding my breath for that application. All right, now we get to some fun stuff. Photon torpedoes. This was, uh, this was something I was always really excited about. I was like, you know, one direct hit from one photon torpedo can pretty much blow up anything. And that was always very exciting to me for some reason. Maybe, maybe it was appealing to like the little seven-year-old boy within me that just wants to blow everything up. So this is what a photon torpedo looks like. And the way it works is actually just super, super simple. A photon torpedo has one side of the torpedo case just filled with normal plain old matter. Just however much matter you want to put in there. Just put it in there and that's half your photon torpedo. The other half 
is the same exact thing except antimatter. So this is a big deal, right? We know how to make antimatter in this universe. This is, this is one of the great conservation laws we have in physics, is if you take enough energy and you collide things together with enough energy, you can spontaneously create pairs of matter and antimatter in equal amounts. As long as you make an anti-proton, you'll also make a proton. As long as you make an anti-electron, you'll also make an electron. This is a great conservation law, right? You might have learned when you were younger and in school that matter can't be created or destroyed. Well, that was a lie. You can create matter. You just also have to create an equal amount of antimatter. And you can destroy matter. You just have to destroy an equal amount of antimatter. The thing that's conserved is energy. How do you create matter and antimatter out of energy? That's an equation that you might have heard of. That's E equals mc squared. That's where that comes from, is that equation literally says that E, that energy, can be converted into mass. And that conversion factor between energy and mass is C squared, is the speed of light squared. But there are rules you have to obey. If you want to make matter, you have to make an equal amount of antimatter. If you want to turn mass back into energy, you do it by turning matter and antimatter both back into pure energy. So that's the idea behind a photon torpedo, is you say, oh, well, we know how to make antimatter, and we know how to make matter. You put matter in one half, you put antimatter in the other half, and you don't let them touch each other until you're ready to detonate the photon torpedo. Right, that's a key. If you have them touch each other, then you've just got a very, very bad bomb on your hands. So, to have a photon torpedo, you need to make antimatter, which we know how to do, although we don't know how to make enough for a torpedo. Uh, I think if you take all the particle accelerators that we've ever used on Earth, like the big one at Fermilab and the Large Hadron Collider at CERN, and you say, what's all the antimatter we've ever made out of all of these? You know, it comes out to like a micrograms worth and you probably need at least a few kilograms worth for a good photon torpedo, you know? Otherwise, you know, how are you gonna fight the Borg? <laughs> you put them to sleep, right? So that's what you need, right? So luckily, Star Trek gave us this also, is they gave us antimatter containment, which, you know, is obviously just a bullet with some casings and a light, and that's how you contain your antimatter. Um, you know, this is, this is Ghostbusters level special effects over here. Um, and, and a big claw device. Um, but that's it, is the most important safety concern for antimatter is you want to keep it completely separated from normal matter. The big problem is if you get an accidental annihilation of matter and antimatter, they emit lots of high energy radiation. They emit this powerful energy quanta that causes things to heat up, that causes things to absorb energy. And when you, you know, absorb energy, you, you tend to speed up. So if you make some, a little bit of an annihilation, it's gonna tend to smack into either matter or antimatter and try and knock it into the other one. So you need some good way to keep them confined. And as we've talked about, electric and magnetic fields are the way to go. That's how you keep matter and antimatter confined. When you're ready for it to detonate, you don't need an impact. All you need to do is say, detonate now, turn those fields off, and boom, there's your explosion. Matter, antimatter, annihilation. And that's how you make a photon torpedo. There is nothing that we need to do scientifically to achieve this breakthrough. There are no new fundamental scientific advances we need to have a photon torpedo. All you have to do is engineer it to make it so. This is a mock-up of what actually happened at the Alpha experiment, is they have this chamber with 
electric and magnetic fields inside. What you do is you take particles and you smash them together and you get matter and antimatter out. And the antimatter, you want to have, say, bent in a magnetic field that you bend the antiprotons in a circle in a certain way and you slow them down. And same things for the anti-electrons, for the positrons. You bend them in a circle the opposite way because they have the opposite charge and you slow them down. Then you bring them together and you make neutral anti-hydrogen. And they've done this. They've done this in a laboratory setting. They've made neutral anti-atoms. They've made them and they've actually made them for so long that they've been able to study them where you shoot little photons at them, little quanta of light. And what they found is if you have a normal hydrogen atom emit energy, right? Because you know electron transitions, right? It drops from high energy to low energy levels and it emits a photon of a very specific wavelength. If you send that photon to an anti-hydrogen atom and you hit the anti-hydrogen atom, it absorbs the photon and it rises the same amount of energy levels that the other one dropped in. So what anti-hydrogen absorbs is the same as what hydrogen emits. And what anti-hydrogen emits is the same as what hydrogen absorbs. They have the same exact properties. They have the same masses. They have the opposite electric charges. They have the same energy absorption and emission properties. Antimatter does exactly what physics expects it to do, including annihilate with normal matter when it touches it. That's all you need. So really practically all we need is a better way to confine large amounts of antimatter and a better way to produce large amounts of antimatter and you've got yourselves a photon torpedo. Uh, go have fun. So here's another thing that I think uh, Star Trek goofed on the timeline about is universal translators, right? You remember Lieutenant Uhura had her big, you know, pre-Bluetooth earpiece? And you remember that uh, Hitoshi Sato from Enterprise, you know, about 100 years before the original Star Trek, Uhura and Sato were language experts. That's what you needed to be a communications officer, is you needed to speak a bunch of different languages. You needed to understand a bunch of different forms of communications. And we're quickly finding ourselves in a world where you don't even need that to talk to someone whose language you don't speak. Think about all the innovations that Star Trek brought us, that it sort of said, oh, imagine a day where a ship's computer will be able to speak to you in your own native language. Imagine a day where you'll be able to give voice commands to your computer and it will do those computations. It will do whatever you told it to. This doesn't sound futuristic anymore. This sounds kind of annoying, like, what, has he seriously never heard of Siri or Alexa or Cortana or, like, Google? Like, seriously. These things are so commonplace now, but even 15 years ago, they seemed like this was just like a primitive idea in its infancy. But that's what the idea of a universal translator was, is that someone would speak in their own native language and some sort of computer software would read that message in, process it, translate it into your language, and then play it back audibly for you. And this is not science fiction anymore. This is something that they did on stage a few months ago when they demoed the Google Pixel. When they demoed the Google Pixel 2. Your smartphone can do this. If you have Skype Translator, which is just a free app you can download, it does this. People with smartphones hooked up to each other and hooked up to an earpiece, you can have someone speak, say, Swedish into the phone and they will speak and the phone will take that information, send it to another phone, which will translate it into whatever language you've got it programmed to, like English, and 
then you'll hear it in your ear in English. And the whole delay on this from when someone speaks it to when you hear it is less than two seconds because it's that fast. So when we talk about a universal translator, all you need is a good enough database for whatever language you're trying to translate, right? As of 2014, we had 77 languages that we could successfully do this for. But we are not done with developments on this front because what we're hoping happens as we build up a greater understanding of machine learning and natural language processing is that someday we may be able to do this on the fly for unknown languages that we're encountering for the first time. And that, that is something that human brains are not necessarily good at, right? We still don't know, for example, um, what things say that are written in Etruscan, right? That's just a long dead language. Uh, if you've never heard of the Etruscans, that's because the Romans conquered them too long ago. They were better gold workers, by the way, than any Roman ever was. So if you ever like Google Etruscan gold, you'll look at that and you'll be like, damn. Um, <laughs> um, but but that's, that's something that a computer may be able to do. As, as we gain a better understanding of languages, the computational power associated with figuring out the meaning of words and translating that into something that we can interpret, that's a task that's not as well suited for humans or any intelligent species that we know of as it may be for, for a computer. So there's, there's even more to come on this front. We have a long way to go before we have, you know, crystalline beings that we can communicate with. Um, but when they call you ugly giant bags of mostly water, know that they're right. <laughs> the holodeck was a revolutionary idea. When you had the holodeck, this basically said like, wow, you can just recreate whatever fictional world you want and it will be pretty much indistinguishable from reality. That the way Star Trek envisioned it is you would have these like tangible matter holograms and you would have this immersive experience in this world where you would see them and hear them and touch them and taste them and smell them and I don't know, maybe whatever other senses, maybe they'd electrocute you too. Like I, it would be this fully immersive experience indistinguishable from reality. And this is something that's kind of on its way. You know, it's not here yet, but what is here yet is already just incredibly impressive compared to what we could have imagined even 10, 15 years ago. The US military uses virtual reality simulators with sights, with sounds, with voice inputs for training missions. Think about what this is useful for. Do you want to put yourself in a life-threatening situation to know how you'll react in a life-threatening situation? Or do you want to have a safe simulated environment where the stakes are not life and death, but rather virtual death, right? A lot easier this way with virtual reality. It's not just sights and sounds, though, that virtual reality gives us. One of the coolest simulations I've ever seen, it was a virtual reality thing where you would put on this headset and you would put these, uh, I guess, earphones on. And what it looked like was happening is there were drops of falling water in three dimensions. And you would hold out your hand and you would see your real hand with the virtual drops of water. And if you manage to maneuver your hand underneath a drop of falling water and the water drop hit your hand, they had these infrasound emitters all surrounding you. And you would feel, whoop, you would feel the splash of water in your hand. Just for a split second, you would get that sensation, that tactile sensation. And most remarkably, it felt wet. So when you're like, oh yeah, like virtual reality, that's just like a eye goggles things that you put on and maybe some headphones too. No, this is more than that. 
if you could pump in smells, if you could recreate a taste experience, if you could stimulate the nerves inside your body to make you feel hunger or fear or whatever it is you wanted to feel, th these are not like pipe dream technologies. This is just a question of how do you implement it. And the next part beyond that that they've already started to implement in some places is what if you have multiple people in the same room all with their virtual reality gear on, it's like they're on the holodeck with you. Uh, so this is something that's coming up really soon. Also, I don't imagine you can quite tell what this is. This is a human finger, and this is a type of matter hologram known as fairy lights. This is a tiny bit of plasma that emits its own light, they're very small right now, as you can see, but you can actually touch them, and they feel like solid objects. So this is another approach to a holodeck-type idea, something that you could see and touch that you don't need any special gear for. And uh, this, is, this is, again, this is another technology that I think is way closer than people are ready to admit. Wow, like it's really possible that what we conceive of as a hologram or the holodeck will be here within 10 or 20 years. And some of you, I can tell, are a little bit worried about like, well, what happens when we rule 34 this? <laughs> and the answer is Star Trek Deep Space Nine already did that. All right, so pads, right? This is what Star Trek The Next Generation and Star Trek Deep Space Nine envisioned as the future of technology. That you would just have this computer that you could hold in your hand and you could like just touch it on a screen and tell it what to do and it would bring up these incredible schematics and it would be interactive and, and you've never seen anything like it. And at that time, in the 1980s and the early 1990s, we hadn't seen anything like that. The way they made these was actually kind of incredible. Those of you who are hardcore Star Trek fans will maybe know the name Mike Okuda. Um, and you will know that these are called Okudagrams because he was the art designer for Star Trek. And what he did was he would design and draw these schematics on colored paper, and he would backlight them with, you know, like neon lights and uh, UL wiring. And then he would just put some like glossy laminate over them, and that's how he made a pad, right? And a pad was just a, like, oh, like it's just a touchscreen computer. Well, we didn't have touchscreen computers back then, because we didn't have touchscreen technology. When Steve Jobs, it was about three years before the first iPad came out, he had a conversation with Bill Gates at a tech summit, and Bill Gates, you know, they were talking about what's the future of technology? What's the future of science? What's the future of what's going to bring us? And Bill Gates sort of, you know, went into this long explanations of what he envisioned was in the pipeline and was coming down. And Steve Jobs just cut him off after about five minutes and said, Star Trek. Just give me Star Trek. That's what we're going to work on. And a few years later, the iPad came out. And this, those of you who have tablet computers, will recognize this as being a super primitive tablet computer. Uh, because I guarantee that for most of us, our smartphones look better than this. But that's it. When the original iPad came out, Michael Okuda himself said, this is it. Like, the pad is real. This is everything Star Trek envisioned. This is, this is what I was trying to create. This is what I was trying and failed to create. Um, so this is, this is a technology that's already here, right? You probably have in your pocket right now something more powerful than anyone in the 24th century ever had. 
which is really incredible, right? You have to remember how fast computational technologies have developed. In 1966, when Star Trek, the original series, debuted, the most powerful computers out there could perform millions of calculations per second, and they filled the size of a room. That was the most powerful computer in 1966. If you were to take all the computers on planet Earth in 1966 and somehow wire them in parallel so that they would all work on the same computing problem, my smartphone, which is three years old at this point, is more powerful than all the computing power of Earth combined was in 1966. Can you imagine what the future is actually going to hold considering how far we've come in 51 years? The stuff we think of as this is cutting edge is going to look so primitive. It's gonna look more primitive than this looks to us today. And that's where I think uh, writing this book surprised me the most, was doing the computation sections, doing those computational technologies. We have come so much farther than Star Trek ever envisioned. An isolinear chip, your flash drive is more powerful than that. Something like a, uh, well, a pad, I mean, come on, this is just craziness to think about that. They invented new forms of data storage because they knew they couldn't talk about bits. Because however many bits they envisioned, megabits, gigabits, terabits, we'd, we'd have it too close in the future. So you'll notice looking at Star Trek The Next Generation, they call everything quads and gigaquads and petaquads and they just made up words because they knew. This was a fun one. Replicators. You'll say, oh yeah, we don't have those. I have to make my old grade tea the old fashioned way. I can't just order it from the food replicator. But what you can do is you can order a whole bunch of things from your 3D printer. And this is really great because what you can 3D print is limited only by the type of feedstock you have for your 3D printer you can print organic material using wood pulp. You can print different types of metal using uh, 3D printers that accept titanium feedstock. You can do a combination of plastic, metal, wood, and even other organic materials by getting the right type of printer. You can print to higher and higher and higher resolution. Uh, they can print down to 20 nanometer accuracy now just by taking a longer time. What I think is most remarkable, though, is you can even 3D print food. All you need to do is put the right food type feedstock. They brought a 3D printer to the International Space Station and they 3D printed pizza. <laughs> this was the first 3D printer on the International Space Station, and it works successfully in zero gravity, which is pretty incredible. So anything you're like, oh, like that's real futuristic, yeah, it is, but it's also here. This was also a fun thing to explore, is the medical and biological advances that we've made, the idea that what we view now as a handicap, something like, you know, oh, you don't have the ability to see. They had a couple of different methods of sight restoration. Probably the most iconic one is a visor, where, you know, you have these implants in your temples, and you hook up this device to it, and you can see what's directly in front of you through it. It gets fed into your optic nerve, to your mind, and you have your sight restored. Or maybe you don't even need something external like that. Maybe you could just have some ocular implants, right? Some implants that will fit in your eye sockets, and then you can see by just having it transmit down through your optic nerve. Now, what's incredible about this is how far this technology has actually come.
This was late 90s technology, where what they did was you would put this prosthetic device over your head and you would look at you know, whatever small print text you wanted to read and it would show up like this on your eyes. So that tiny little text over there shows up like this. This was the first device that was built that could successfully help people that were legally blind see something that they could not otherwise see. This device I show you because it was developed by NASA, and I want you to pay attention to the letters. It was called the Joint Optical Reflective Display. J-O-R-D-Y. Good job, NASA. Today, we have devices like this. This is a group uh, at Monash University in Australia that developed what they call a hat pack. And what this does is this is a device you wear on your head and it will take in visual data from the environment wherever your camera's pointed in front of you. And it will send signals this is the cool part. You don't even need eyeballs. You don't even need optic nerves. You can send signals directly to your brain's visual cortex. And you don't even need to have this on your head. You could do this wirelessly. And it doesn't even need to be visible light. You can take light from anywhere in the electromagnetic spectrum. They estimate that if this technology becomes widespread, it could restore sight to about 85% of people who are blind or vision impaired today, which would be an incredible medical benefit. But one of the things that Star Trek taught us that I think is always important to keep in mind is with any new technology, there are big ethical concerns that come with it. You might say, hey, this is a no-brainer. If you can talk about restoring sight to the blind, what's unethical about that? And I'll say the same thing that's unethical about leaving your phone password unprotected is you have hackers out there. Do you want to really restore sight to someone if the risk is they can be fed false visual information, if they're driving a car and it tells them the road goes to the left but it really goes to the right, if they're you know, going to encounter someone and they, they have their position misread and so they just walk into people or they're walking through a minefield and they think they're walking through a forest, like there's real dangers to false information out there. And I think that if you start talking about putting cortical implants in someone's mind, you better make sure that you have some good cybersecurity there to keep any nefarious actors out, because um, they're out there. There are also plenty of other technologies that uh, I'm excited to talk about. But before I end, when we brought up the ethical ones about um, cortical implants, it makes me think of some other things that maybe Star Trek hasn't envisioned. Um, you remember the Borg Collective when they describe it, that it's like hearing a stream of a million voices all at once. Imagine what that would be like if instead of broadcasting your thoughts on Twitter or Tumblr, or for the older crew here, LiveJournal, Imagine if you could just be plugged in where those are your thoughts that are being broadcasted out there. And if you want, you can tap into that continuum and you can listen to whoever's voice you want. I bet you that if that technology were available, um, there would be a whole bunch of people that would just choose to go online in that way, that would not worry about security or privacy, that would just choose to try it out and go broadcast their thoughts and listen to what other thoughts people were broadcasting. That's potentially not that far away. We have technologies where people with, for instance, locked-in syndrome, they can't even move 
a finger, they can't even bat an eyelash. But just by thinking about it, they can be plugged into a computer that they can select letters from with their mind and use it to communicate with the outside world. If they can do that, there's no reason to believe that you won't be able to directly interface your brain with a computer for much larger bandwidths of data transmission in the future. There are crazy technologies that are that were not only unfathomable 51 years ago, that are hard to fathom today, that are already on their way to reality. If we use it in the right way, we can really bring about a brilliant future for ourselves, maybe one that in some ways even exceeds our wildest sci-fi dreams. So just to conclude some things, most of the Trek-inspired technologies are physically possible. Of all the ones I brought up in the book, I'd say there are only four that may not be physically possible. Warp drive is one. If, if negative mass or negative energy doesn't exist, it's gonna be really hard to create warp drive. But if it does, then it's possible. A second one that's maybe hard, subspace communication. Why? Because there's no such thing as subspace. That doesn't mean there isn't necessarily a way to communicate faster than light, particularly if warp drive is possible. If you can deform space to send spaceships faster than light, there's no reason you can't deform space to send communication signals faster than light. Artificial gravity is another one. We think of artificial gravity as like gravity plating or some type of field you can set up. But that might also be physically possible. If there's something out there with a negative gravitational charge, then you can have all the things associated with artificial gravity, including inertial dampeners and things to shield you from acceleration. And finally, one thing that I think may be impossible, this is another ethical gray area, is the transporter. We can do quantum teleportation, which means you can teleport information about matter instantaneously. You could say, okay, I'm going to pick someone in the audience and say, you, we're gonna read in all the quantum information about your body. We're gonna read in the information about every single particle, and we're gonna entangle all of that information with another set of particles. So the information in you and the information in here are complementary. If I measure the information in this set of particles, I know all the information about you. And then I transport these particles to the transporter's destination. And I have all of your information. Even though you're doing stuff to change, it's all here. I can have that information. I could use this information to reconstruct you, atom by atom, exactly as you are. But those of you who've used computers know there's a big difference between control X, control V, and control C, copy, delete, and paste. There's a very big difference between those two. One of them means like, oh, like I've just changed your address and you've been transported. The other one means, oh crap, I just created Thomas Riker. <laughs> so pretty important to make sure we do that. I wouldn't have any problem transporting an inanimate object like that. This could be great for shipping or freight or anything like that. But one of the things that I love in the first season of Enterprise, the prequel series, they're talking about the transporter and one crew member says to the other that Captain Archer says he wouldn't put his dog through that thing. And I wouldn't either. Many of the technologies that Star Trek envisioned are already here. And many more that aren't quite here yet will be in just another decade or two. Finally, the ones that aren't, like the four I just talked about, they may yet become viable 
with new scientific discoveries. And I want to just leave everyone with a positive message that the future is up to us. The future that we're going to have, it's up to us to create it. We might look at some things and envision like, oh, things are not turning out the way I want, but they can, and it's up to us to make it so. All right, thank you. Thank you, Ethan. Thank you for listening. This podcast and Science on Tap are created by VIA Productions, and we are based in Portland, Oregon in the U.S. If you want to find out more about how to go to one of our events, check out our website at scienceontaporwa.org, and that last part stands for Oregon and Washington. You can also find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at scienceontaporwa. As I mentioned, check out the episode notes for more information and links to Ethan's book and blog. As always, I'd like to say a big thank you to my volunteers who have been helping me run events for years, and these events would not happen without them. The volunteers are Scott Fry, Chris Gowan, Sam Lauk, Rita Nigren, and Steve Perry, as well as a bunch of other people. I'd also like to say a special thank you to Amber Peoples for coming in and for running things for the past few months. Also, a final thank you to Jonathan Colton for letting us use his song Mandelbrot Set as our theme music. Just in time to save